welcome to this special Budget Night edition of The Drum. I'm Tim Palmer and tonight the Treasurer has delivered his promised surplus in a budget aimed at families and low income earners. But there have been big cuts to defence and foreign aid while revenue forecasts from the mining tax have already been downgraded. So how vulnerable is that surplus and who are the real winners and losers from tonight's budget? Our panel tonight, David Hetherington from the think tank Per Capita, former Liberal MP Ross Cameron and joining us in Canberra, fresh from the lockup, Jessica Irvin from the Sydney Morning Herald and Adam Crichton from The Australian. Thanks all for joining us. You can join us too on Twitter to share your thoughts on the budget using the hashtag The Drum. Well, Wayne Swan has delivered his fifth budget, keeping his promise to put the nation's finances back in black. A surplus of $1.5 billion is forecast for next financial year. There's a $3.6 billion package for low-income earners called Spreading the Benefits of the Boom. That includes $1.8 billion in extra family support. The government's committed a $1 billion over four years for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. The planned 1% cut in company tax will be scrapped and a promised increase to overseas aid will be deferred. The Treasurer says it's a budget of discipline and restraint. The four years of surpluses I announced tonight are a powerful endorsement of the strength of our economy, resilience of our people and the success of our policies. This budget is about discipline and restraint, but also about priorities, ensuring precious funds are redirected to the purposes and people that need them most. Across the budget, by saving and redirecting $33.6 billion, we're balancing the books, making room for $5 billion in new payments to households, finding an extra $714 million to help companies compete on top of the $3.7 billion in small business tax breaks, funding the historic first stage of a national disability insurance scheme investing in dental services for those who can least afford them, and strengthening the aged care system. So straight away, we know it's a surplus, no surprise, but we know it's only $1.5 billion, David Hetherington. The, the Treasurer was suggesting that was good in case the economic tide turns again from Europe. Is it enough for you? Does it convince you? Well, uh, the credibility of the surplus is really um, based in a set of external factors, namely the tax revenues. Uh, they've been the big swing variable in the budget over the last three or four years. Whether Wayne Swan can deliver a surplus in 2012-13 is critically dependent on the tax revenues growing in the way that they're currently forecasting, which in turn is dependent on what happens in the global economy, in particular in Europe. Um, so uh, the theory would say that it's very good macroeconomic policy that you spend on stimulus in the tough times as we did in 2008, 9, 9, 10, and then you try and pay back that by getting back to surplus in the good times, and the headline numbers are good at the moment, but it does depend on, on that tax take. Well, if it's meant to be a belt tightening exercise, it's a funny feeling one, isn't it, Ross Cameron? You tell everyone we're tightening the belts, putting something away, here's $1,800 to get you started <laughs> to some families. If a family on $85,000 with two kids at school apparently will get around $1,800 up front. So does that work for you? Well, look, we've, we've had talk about belt tightening since uh, the very first of the Swan budgets. Everyone is going to be a tough budget. This is going to be a tough budget. You know? And this is this, this, this desire to emphasise the fiscal restraint credentials. Uh, and, you know, Kevin Rudd presented himself as a fiscal and economic conservative. But what we have seen, in fact, uh, is a government that has added uh, rough numbers up billion dollars to the indebtedness of the Australian people going forward. Um, so Wayne Swan has been borrowing at roughly a hundred million dollars a day uh, since he became treasurer. And so then you get this, uh, this cr interesting situation where he can go for sort of three years borrowing at a hundred million dollars a day and saying that has absolutely no impact on upward pressure on interest rates. 
then when he promises a surplus of one-tenth of one percent of GDP, he, he takes credit for the downward pressure on interest rates. So I, I don't think you can have it both ways. The performance on interest rates has not been that bad, though. He's got a reasonable argument to make, hasn't he, Ross Cameron? Well, I mean, what, what I think we're seeing on interest rates is that uh, we, we do have a patchy economy and outside of the resources sector we have a lot of uh, a lot of businesses that are struggling and while the retail sector will no doubt welcome the cash splash uh, which is being offered in place of a cut in company there's tax, a headline uh, it will not be welcomed by the 700 a thousand Australian small business people who are actually generating the wealth that is required to uh, to justify the very optimistic and rosy assumptions which are at the heart of this budget Jessica Irvine uh, Ross Cameron's let off on the budget uh, bingo card with cash splash let me throw another one at fistful of dollars because Rob Oakeshott says this amounts to a sector by sector mini stimulus package, especially the handouts to families for school, uh, school expenses and for the family uh, tax benefit part A. Do you, is that how it's intended and why won't the government say it if that's what it is? Well, look, if you look at the budget as a whole, it is uh, contractionary. We are moving from a quite a large deficit into surplus. So from that sort of point of view, it is contractionary. But we've always said um, that it does matter what sort of cuts they do. That, that affects the real economy. So if you take money out of the pockets of households, uh, that has quite a large impact on aggregate demand, which is actually what the Reserve Bank is interested in. They're interested in how much demand there is sloshing around the economy. If you take, if you apply your cuts to uh, foreigners, for example, like by cutting foreign aid, uh, they're not people that were going to spend any money in the Australian economy. So from that point, or if, vote. You, if you're robbing from them, <laughs> or, or vote, uh, not in our country. So uh, if you're taking money off them uh, and giving it to households in Australia, yeah, there is actually an argument to say that in the short term, at least, that sort of is a stimulus. It, of course, depends what households decide to do with that money. And what we know about households at the moment is they're not really keen on, well, on spending quite money. Quite right. When the, when the tide has turned and people have moved to a, a savings philosophy, what's the evidence of how it works when you inject a bit of money into their wallets? Well, what we sort of saw during the GFC is people did actually save quite a lot of the cash splash that went out then. Um, but the argument is that if you give them the money, even if people save the money, it brings forward the day that they will feel more comfortable that their debts are under control and that they are able to spend again. Uh, so by targeting the households, there is sort of an argument that that, that is a weak area of the economy. Um, by redirecting some funds that way, you know, perhaps, perhaps it won't hurt demand. Adam Crichton, the way that it's means tested, does this work out as more middle class welfare or is it a progressive handout uh, that will get some political rewards as well and take people up to when the carbon tax compo kicks in? Yeah, with, with Family Tax Benefit A, I think there's a mix of good measures and bad measures. I think that the means testing, which the government introduced in previous budgets, is a good thing. I think the fact that they're no longer to pay a Family Tax Benefit A to so-called children who are over 18, and that's been a knocked on the head. But, of course, they're also increasing the rate of payment, which I think is a very bad thing. I mean, as for cash evidence that shows that people aren't as stupid as, as ordinary Keynesian economics uh, supposes. So they, they but, do But is it, is it at least targeted to the right people? Well, look, I mean, I suppose if you're going to give money to people through the redistribution system, then you give it to you know, low-income earners. But I mean, I, I still don't think a family on $150,000 is a low-income earner. I mean, we saw last week the latest income uh, tax statistics came out and they are a reminder again that 95% of Australians have a taxable income of less than about $110,000. So, you know, being welfare to people who are very, very high up in the income distribution. And that's, that's you know, quite a shameful thing, really. Uh, David Hetherington, Political side of that, what sort of return do you think the government will get when it gives this money out and it coincides fairly neatly with the carbon tax compensation and the changes to the uh, the minimum taxation level? Do you think there will be some sort of feel-good factor for the government come July? Uh, 
I'm sure there will be. I mean, there are lots of ways in this in, in which this looks like a pre budget. You know, we're, we're not due for an election until late 2013, so we're due to have one more budget before then. But this feels in some senses like a pre-election budget, in particular with the timing of some of these these cash handouts. So I think um, there probably will be a short-term hit for the government in terms of a, a lift in popularity once the money hits the pockets. Um, they are trying to redistribute some of the stimulatory effectors just referred to in that they're trying to uh, get it into the household sector, so to get kind of retail spending um, on the uptick again, that's where confidence has been particularly weak. Um, you know, Ross mentioned the effect of the, of the deferral or the, the cancellation of the company tax cut on small businesses, but one of the things they're doing there is trying to give small businesses some free to improve their cash flows in terms of their own tax liabilities, so to claim back um, previous tax payments against current losses. So they'll be hoping that there are some confidence building measures, if you like, um, built in there. I think one final observation to Adam's point. Uh, in the last few years, this government has tried to um, shift the direction of the tax and transfer system um, to remove a lot of that kind of um, middle and even upper class welfare. And I think this budget goes further in doing that in that a lot so of it's, measures, it's still a handout, but it's a right. more progressive it's handout. It's a progressive budget, you know, and in that sense, yeah. it's kind of redistributive in the sense of, of classic labour values. Yeah, that's right. David's right. They they have moved further in the right way, but it's still not far enough in my view. But, but I mean, he is right. They have, they have increased means testing. I think the net medical benefits expense is now being means tested as well in this budget. So that's a, that's a yeah, further private progress health in that insurance. direction. Yeah. Yeah, Ross Cameron, that. what do you make of this electorally? How do you think people will react? And in particular, will the government get anything from associating having a bit more money around it at the time the carbon tax actually starts? Well, I think you can't uh, spend $300 billion and not get something right. I mean, you've got to be able to do something good with $300 billion. And I think there are measures that are in this budget better targeted than they were previously. And there's a range of measures that I would instinctively be supportive of, um, such as a billion dollars to start funding the uh, National Disability Insurance Scheme. Um, I like the, uh, the clawback or what, however the small business uh, 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 deduction is being described. Uh, but you do nonetheless wind up in a situation where Labor sort of promised the Australian people a mining resource rent tax and a cut in the company tax rate. And what we wind up with in the budget is the mining resource rent tax and no cut in the company tax well, let's, rate. Let's and go that, with that I now. would let's, say, is an expression of labour values. Let's have a look at those cuts because, of course, the government has had to make savings to deliver this very narrow surplus. Defence has been hit hard, as expected, but even more so, with $5.4 billion in cuts. Thousands of public service jobs will go. The commitment to increase foreign aid to half a percent of gross national income has been deferred by a year and that will save almost $3 billion. And the government will save $2 billion by scrapping plans for simpler tax returns. Finance Minister Penny Wong admits the surplus is vulnerable to unforeseen events, but she says Labor has planned well for that. We've made nearly $34 billion worth of cuts uh, in order to ensure that we not only have a surplus in the 12-13 year, but surpluses growing every year of the Ford estimates. That but, demonstrates our determination. Uh, that's a very substantial amount of saving. Jessica Irvine, the government, or the Prime Minister in particular last week when defence cuts were being discussed, did say there was more to come in the budget, so the figure is significantly higher than the three or four billion that had appeared in newspapers last week at 5.4 billion. Do you think uh, this will leave them open to a suggestion that they're leaving Australia open in some way in the defence area? Well, the problem with spending on defence is it's a bottomless pit. You know, you, you will never know how much you need to spend to be completely safe and where you draw the line is always going to be a subjective, you know, matter. And the problem with defence spending is, it, you know, the money t seems, seems to go into this pit, which is defence and defence uh, procurement. Uh, and people, there's very little sort of visibility for people as to where that money's actually going. So, I mean, economists always say, cut back on that spending. This is, you know, big boys toys, you know, you're buying a few planes and a few submarines uh, in a tight budget can 
dish and you could spend that money elsewhere. So I don't think economists are going to be complaining about uh, cutting defence spending. I'm sure all the defence and analysts will think that's a, a horror thing. You know, it's, I don't really have any expertise on whether we're about to be invaded because of the budget. <laughs> yeah, we'll leave the strategy to others. But one area where there have already been complaints, uh, David Hetherington, is the scrapping of company tax that Ross referred to. It's been described by uh, Peter Anderson as a dreadful breach of promise. That's not the kind of thing that this Prime Minister likes to hear. And yet it is just a 1% company tax cut. It, it was inevitable, wasn't it, that this was going to go? A couple of things to say about that. Um, the first is that um, it's in fact the Coalition that has um, said it will not support the company tax cut in the House. The Greens have said we only support the company tax cut if it's given to small businesses only. And what the government's taken there is the opportunity to say, OK, to comply at that game, we'll take that refusal to support the tax cut and take the revenue saving from it and put it elsewhere. So that's the kind of the straight politics of it. Um, the other thing worth noting is that um, because it's a, it's a kind of promised cut, it's not actually a... a you know, an increased burden on business in any sense. It's a, it's a benefit that is foregone into the future. So it shouldn't have a... Um, so it's not really a cut at all? Well, it, it was a cut that never happened. And, 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 <laughs> well, you it was know, a cut short, that was already the, smaller the kind of, than the, the cut that was initially will be around. Did she break the promise? Didn't she break the promise? And, and Labor will be saying, look, we put it forward, we tried to get it through the House, and the Coalition wouldn't support it. Well, will they get away with that, Ross Cameron? Because it, surely it would have looked better politically if they had tried to go further negotiating with the Greens and sincerely tried to get it through and then maybe failed and people would accept that argument. Now it seems much more convenient to line it up with a surplus. Sure. I think... Uh, and, I, and I should just make the point that the Coalition opposed the 1% uh, drop in company tax, not because it's opposed to reducing taxes, uh, but because it had committed to abolish the mining resource rent tax. And so Abbott took the view that he couldn't, on the one hand, seek to take the benefit uh, of the policy, uh, while at the same time opposing the uh, the more difficult uh, measure that was required to fund it, which I think was the honourable approach. Now it was the Greens then who said, "Well, we won't uh, we won't support this measure unless it's limited to a very small uh, to to the, to the lowest and smallest uh, uh, small businesses." And then Wayne Swan turns around and wants to blame Tony Abbott for the failure of the policy. Well. Uh, Labor was the one who formed a coalition with the Greens. Uh, Labor's biggest problems arise out of the fact that its direction and soul has really been sucked very significantly to the left by the Greens. Uh, I don't think Wayne Swan can then turn around and blame Tony Abbott because he couldn't persuade his Greens coalition partner to support his policy. Adam Crichton, the government's playing with time a bit here. It's been Wayne Swan, the Time Lord, to a certain extent, hasn't it? Because we have instead this uh, shifting of uh, the write-downs of assets for companies as uh, some sort of payoff for losing the company tax. And at the same time, the foreign aid increase has been delayed. So the government just seems to be uh, mucking around with its diary to achieve this surplus to some extent. Is that right? Yeah, that's certainly true, actually. I mean, I think the headline surplus figure of $1.5 billion is completely meaningless. I mean, the, the important way to analyse this budget is to focus on the quality of the, of the underlying spending and the quality of the underlying taxes and, and seeing how they play out on incentives. I'd just like to give our viewers one, actually two examples of how this surplus has been arrived at. $1.1 billion of grants to local governments were scheduled for next financial year. They have been brought forward and paid right away, so this financial year. So there's $1.1 billion. And also there's $300 million of so-called special dividends which are being called upon from one, um, a one government-owned corporation called the, uh, the Export Finance Assistance Corporation. Um, $200 million there and then there's another $100 million special dividend from uh, the Australian Reinsurance Pool which I had actually never ever heard of. So, <laughs> so basically if you sum all those together that's, that almost gets you to $1.5 billion. And certainly I mean, as you mentioned earlier, as the panellists mentioned earlier, there's a, um, a lot of delaying of previously announced measures, you know, such as the simple $500 tax deduction and also yes, the 50% so cut on interest. That saves, that saves the government $2 billion by um, postponing or delaying this simpler tax returns program, a program that isn't even in place yet. What does that mean for the economy? Wasn't that meant to generate benefits in itself? Well, uh, certainly having simpler tax, return, simpler tax returns is good for the ordinary person. It's not so good for the, um, for the accounting industry, perhaps, at least in the short term, because I think a lot of their work... I mean, for instance, 
The Henry Review showed that Australians rely on tax agents more than any other country in the world except Italy. That's how, that's how complicated our tax system is. So I think trying to make it simpler should be a priority. So it's a little sad that this has been delayed. Uh, that, was a met, that was actually a recommendation in the Henry Review, um, as was the 50% uh, discount on interest income. That's also been delayed and they've made substantial savings there. Um, so yeah, this is basically just you know shuffling things around. I mean, it's you know the budget really is a political exercise. I mean, it's entirely a political exercise. I mean, we saw so much of it leaked in advance. Um, it's just getting worse and worse. Oh. It's a circus. Yeah. Uh, Jessica Irvine, you mentioned before the cuts to the program of increasing aid or the delay in that, which brings the government 2.9 billion dollars better off. Uh, is it mm. fair? Do you think that at a time when people are tightening belts that the people of the Democratic Republic of Congo or Solomon Islands do their part for the Australian economy? Well, the government was sort of quick to point out today that uh, this was one of the fastest growing parts of the budget and it would be irresponsible for them not to look at it. And they also make the point that we are still quite a large donor uh, on foreign aid. I mean, it's I guess it's again a subjective decision people would spend different money on it. They're saying, we don't have the money now. It's not that, you know, the goal is still to get to, I think it's half a percentage point of gross national income. That is the goal, but that's only being delayed and that's, you know, you can't get away from that. Uh, what is really interesting in the budget is there seems to be this two-step that Swan has sort of got rolling in the last couple of years is that in one of your budgets you roll out uh, some new spending announcements and that you know last year it was things like and the year before cut company tax uh, have a standard deduction that will put mo more money in people's pockets and have a a break on bank interest earnings uh, and then everyone loves you for that and then the next year you cut it and everyone thinks that you're such a prudent budget manager, you know, you're making lots of decisions. It's a great way of saving decisions. money, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so a lot of the savings that they are making this year are actually policies that they had announced and hoped to implement that they're now saying are too expensive or maybe they shouldn't have done in the first place. It's not a very good reflection on their belief in those policies in the first place. Uh, David, this aid uh, budget reduction that's an international leadership issue, isn't it? And very much the way the government likes to proclaim itself as leading in, in the climate change fight. Isn't it something we signed up for internationally? Yeah, I think an activist middle power is what the uh, international relations analysts like to think of us as. And, and our commitment to the Millennium Development Goals, which is, which is the, um, the particular arrangement that we've locked ourselves into, um, requires us, I think, to get our... Um, share of GDP that we donate in foreign aid to something like 0.7% of GDP. And what they're saying now is we're going to push that back. Look, I think in the context of, of the various global economies around, um, we're doing pretty well. As Jessica noted, um, our aid contributions are going up quite rapidly. So I think given the cutbacks that other countries have been made making, other rich countries have been making, um, we're not going to look like a laggard. Uh, the other point worth making is that the developing countries are doing better and better and better, and it won't be too long before we start thinking of them as the as the sources of the aid and, and potentially um, old Europe as the recipient. Oh, that is a sad idea. Ross Cameron, uh, do you think that uh, this is a fair place to cut, that charity should begin it at home when things get tough? Well, I think this is a little bit of a poke in the eye to Kevin Rudd, uh, for whom this was one of his, along with, uh, you know, the great moral challenge of climate change, uh, was the great moral obligation of uh, caring for the developing world. And uh, he, Kevin, made a bit of a hero of himself in various uh, sort of global arenas by, uh, you know, ratcheting up Australia's commitment. And so I don't think Wayne Swan spent too long deliberating over this particular uh, area for, for cutting. But... Um, I think, look, I'm a big supporter in trade rather than aid. Uh, I am, while I'm a, you know, while I support microfinance, I think it's a useful form of engagement. I think I still want to be convinced that um, a lot of our aid measures are actually making a long-term difference of that building capability and capacity and confidence in the recipient. For example, at Papua New Guinea, um, a country in which about 50% of its economy is the GDP is made up by foreign aid and what we have basically done is trained the Papua New Guineans to become a sort of mendicant 
people without mm. dignity or honour and they are well on their way to complete collapse not for want of aid, but for want of the muscles of self-reliance, which and the aid led, has led by members of parliament who arrive in Australia with a million dollars to That's take right. to the Star Casino, unfortunately. Well, the government's decision to push back its overseas aid commitment to make savings has raised the ire of the Greens. They say the government could have kept its promise if it had cut $2 billion in fuel tax credits for the mining industry. Greens leader Christine Milne says breaking the commitment makes Australia look bad. The international community will not look very favourably on Australia choosing to allow the mining industry to maximise their profits at the cost of our most vulnerable developing country neighbours. That... Adam, is that a, a reasonable, reasonable argument that the mining industry is in a better position to absorb a cut than uh, the poorer nations of Africa? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it's in a better position to absorb a cut relative to other industries in Australia. But just on the foreign aid question, I think it's, I mean, I completely agree with Ross, it's such an excellent place to cut. I mean, I think there's so much evidence that shows that this aid is a complete waste of money. It, you know, lines the pockets of international bureaucrats and various so-called NGOs who are always lobby very strongly for it. Um, I mean, if we are giving aid at all, then certainly it should be in the region. And actually a fantastic example of, of trade versus aid, uh, Ross's comment just uh, reminded me, I mean, we had extremely expensive bananas in Australia last year and this is basically because we don't allow Philippine uh, bananas into Australia and that is a developing country and that is one way that we could have helped them by accepting their bananas and of course it also would have helped Australian consumers as well who would have had much cheaper bananas but no 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 we still maintain these various trade barriers and then we you know shovel money at people and and just finally I think the best argument against foreign aid is that we've been doing it for decades and decades and decades, so clearly it doesn't work. I mean, there's you know, vast, vast torrents of money are shovelled at poor countries, not just by Australia. Can we say that they haven't I mean, made improvements? David's mentioned that you can chart the yeah, well, explosion of conditions see, in many developing David, nations. But... Um, look, yeah, they've improved, but I think they would have improved a lot more if they hadn't have been helped so much. I mean, especially cash handouts. I mean, they are extremely would bad. The I mean... Would the mining companies improve their productivity if they didn't get handouts for fuel? Uh, look, the fuel tax credit scheme, as far as I understand it, I mean, I, I, I think that's, that's another distortion of, of prices, and so I don't really support that either. I'd rather kind of all firms pay the same price for fuel. And in fact, it is a very expensive item, the fuel tax credit scheme. In fact, I thought, it was about two, I thought it was about $5 billion a year, actually, the fuel tax credit scheme, which basically makes petrol cheaper for, for large trucking firms and so forth, and I think was introduced by the Howard government in the early 2000s. Um, I would support, you know, pairing that back. I mean, just on the issue of the environment, um, I mean, if we are going to have a carbon tax, and it seems like we are, then it's extremely important that we get rid of all of these other little subsidies, you know, such as the, re the renewable energy target and so forth. I mean, if you have a market mechanism to discourage use of carbon, emission of carbon, then you don't need all of the other explicit you subsidies. You do have to leave it to the market. Well, maybe that's for the next budget. As to this one, the opposition's accused the government of fudging the numbers on the budget bottom line. Shadow Treasurer Joe Hockey says the government talks tough but fails to deliver. This government is relying on a $39 billion increase in revenue this year. $39 billion, $34 billion of extra tax this year. And they're claiming it's a tough budget? Well, it's a handout budget. It's an incredibly confused budget. Uh, it's got no clear message about the economy. It's going to disappoint a lot of people when they see the details. There's no story about productivity. There's nothing about growth. Unemployment is going to increase. Uh, the government's forecasts from last year have proven to be false. And what we've seen is a $22 billion blowout in the deficit this year, and they expect us to believe they're going to have a surplus next year of one and a half billion. Sure, Joe. David, is Joe Hockey right there that uh, some of the projections don't look that great, such as unemployment and underemployment? And is the real risk here some of the big potential shortfalls? Because we've seen in this budget 20% wiped off what was expected from the mining tax, and there's discussion about the pricing of the carbon of carbon under the carbon tax. So is the government completely open to some of those biggest numbers falling apart for them? Look, I think uh, Joe Hockey's overstating the, the, the projected danger in, in unemployment blowing out. For example, I think the number in the budget is 5.5% and, and last month numbers might have been 5.3%, I think. Um, and the government is saying, and, and Treasury are saying in their projections, that um, you know, there, there's still weakness in some of the retail and, and, um, and tradable sectors that are exposed to the high dollar. So there's a bit of an uptick in unemployment there, but not much. Um, whether it's a tough budget... Look, I think $33 billion in savings is quite an impressive amount. 
whether they're delivered is, um, you know, the proof of the pudding's in the eating, and we'll see that uh, this time next year, I guess, about the time we're, we're heading into an election. Um, and as I said right at the start, the big swing factor is, is the revenues. Revenues have started to, to come back. They, they dropped off um, enormously from 2008-9, and, and they started to come back in kind of uh, 10, 11, 11, 12. What they're saying about the revenue shortfall there is relative to a previous forecast. And this is where I get very kind of dubious about the whole exercise. The forecasting is really a mugs game. It's a bit of a kind of... Yeah, quite, but when, you, when you're talking about the mining tax, it was not just a forecast, it was a selling point for the whole idea. Well, I mean, you're saying that the mining tax is coming in 20% lower. It's coming in 20% lower than a forecast that came out of a, a macroeconomic model. A um, forecast that had been challenged by miners like uh, Twiggy Forest. Jessica Irvine, what do you think about the vulnerability when it comes to revenues? Uh, as David was mentioning, the income tax revenues are looking weak. GST, because of retail and other factors looking weak and now the mining tax is this the Achilles heel? Yeah well I think anyone who goes looking at the budget and expects it to actually predict the future with complete and total accuracy is probably looking for something that was never there and is never going to be there and I think Joe sort of forgets that if, if and when he's in government again uh, he'll have the same people doing the figures for him and they are forecasts. Uh, we like to think about them as real sort of numbers but they're only real in terms of how they actually turn out and it's true that there are things uh, like the mining tax revenue and even the carbon tax revenue that are incredibly uncertain and involve an, you know, a number of different assumptions to actually sort of try and get a number on paper. You have to get a number on paper. Joe hasn't had a lot of luck uh, with getting his numbers right on paper and getting that through sort of accountancy firms that have looked at his numbers. So <laughs> I sort of, I look for something a little bit more interesting than to just say Treasury gets it wrong. Yeah, Treasury gets mm -hmm. it wrong. Every, every economist who tries to forecast the economy gets it wrong. And we were talking earlier about what really is the sort of perhaps a big missed opportunity in this budget. And the one glaring error uh, and the one thing that we are still failing to do is to still recoup enough of the boom for all Australians. And the failure that we had on the mining tax, which uh, shortchanged Australian taxpayers of billions of dollars of, of revenue, that is still in there. And when we talk about sharing the benefits of the boom, we're talking about sharing the tiny slice of pie that they had the guts to sort of uh, get a few years ago. And there's been no attempt to revisit that. I mean, perhaps the government is beyond that at this point. They don't have the political capital to spend. Uh, but that's the sort of, if you were really interested in putting the, the budget back on a sustainable footing, uh, uh, getting your tax base straight, uh, you would have gone and got some more money out of the miners. Well, given your disappointment in that area of the mining tax, how do you feel that another 20% has already been wiped off? What you say was already not a significant enough impost on the industry. Yeah, well, we have this sort of uh, temporary factor where the, the, the resource companies are able to claim upfront deductions, so that's reducing the amount of tax that they're paying. And, uh, this is company tax, and that's going to increase later. Uh, all of this depends on commodity prices, um, and we now are looking at a situation where our terms of trade have peaked. They're still very high. We're still getting good prices, but all those revenue estimates for the mining tax depends what happens in the rest of the world. It depends when Brazil and Russia, you know, catch up and start supplying the same commodities that we're supplying. Uh, we really, if we want to get this money in the pocket, you needed to get it now. Uh, and there is a risk that, you know, this mining boom will pass us by and, and we will sort of think, oh, where did all that money go? Uh, Adam, there's Jessica's missed opportunity in this budget. What would you say was the big missed opportunity? What isn't there that should be? Oh, basically, I'd just like to see a lot more tax reform, a lot more things from the Henry Review implemented. And I think I think the Australian tax system is the biggest uh, ball and chain around the Australian economy by far, and it never receives enough attention. I mean, as for the mining tax, it raises so little money, I don't really know why they're bothering. I mean, they, they might as well not have it. It's going to create a huge amount of paperwork and basically be a massive subsidy to lawyers and accountants, and I'm sure it won't, won't raise as... Uh, much money, but but basically tax reform. But but just just finally too. I mean, we, you know, we talked about revenues. Um, I mean, I think the Treasury is probably more likely to have gotten it right this time. I mean, they've gotten it wrong three years in a row, and I'm sure they've learnt their lesson. On the expense side, if what if what the budget is forecasting actually comes true, it 
will be the biggest fall in expenses since 1970. So, you know, just to finish on a positive note for the government, I mean, if they manage to bring off a 4.3% fall in expenses, that will be extremely impressive. But, of course, we have to wait and see. Surely that will put to bed the myth of uh, Labor governments being incapable of financial responsibility. But nonetheless, David Hetherington, what did you look for in the budget papers that wasn't there? Well, Jessica's already nominated the politically impossible redesign of the mining tax, so I, I, can't, I can't point out that one. But I think the other great taboo, the other great untouchable in, in Australian tax policy is negative gearing. I think um, we should not have reinstated negative gearing in the late 80s when we did. And in particular, I think what it does is um, fuel speculative investment in property. I think for new build property where we have a, a, yeah. a supply shortage, that's not a bad thing. But for, Pumps up asset for, prices. and uh, so, yeah. so I would have looked at negative gearing. Ross Cameron, in a few seconds, what would you have liked to have seen that isn't there? Oh, well, I think you've got to concentrate more effort and energy on those who are actually creating wealth, who are creating jobs, who are making decisions to invest. And I think, uh, you know, there's plenty of attention here on the instinct to spend and, and to consume. Uh, but I do think uh, this is a government that's alienated from the business sector. I think there needs to be a reconciliation. I think we've got to say to those 700,000 small businesses, we appreciate what you're doing and we're going to make life easier for you, not harder. Maybe next budget, if it's not achieved this time, because that is all for our budget night special of The Drum. Thanks very much to the panel, David Hetherington, Ross Cameron, in Canberra, Jessica Irvine and Adam Crichton. You can check out the website at abc.net.au.